بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى الطيبين الطاهرين. I am grateful to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for being able to get together again today. Alhamdulillah. And I have to say I'm very appreciative of your questions and comments. It was very good and very encouraging. The discussion that inshallah we are going to have uh, has two major parts. One is I'm going to continue with the characteristics of an Islamic society, ideal society, as far as its ethical, spiritual values are concerned. And then I talk about the concept of velaya and its social dimensions. I hope we will have enough time to address both. We said that one of the characteristics of such society is that this society is a society which is based and built around truth. To be truthful is a very fundamental or the fundamental, most fundamental quality. And in the Quran, we find that God the Almighty asks us to be concerned with truth. This is very important. It's not just enough to accept the truth when you come to know the truth. You must look for the truth. You have to be concerned. If you have concern, then you would not just relax and say, okay, if I come to know the truth, I will accept. You have to search for the truth. This search for the truth is very important. And then when you search the truth for the truth and you come to know the truth, which is normally the case, it's very unlikely that if someone honestly looks for the truth, doesn't find it. So when you find the truth, you have to accept and acknowledge the truth. And then thirdly, the Quran says that you must not cover up the truth. You know, sometimes we know that there is a truth. We don't reject it, but we somehow try to bring other things, you know, to hide the truth. This is not accepted. Also, if it's needed, we must bear witness about something which is true. So if someone, you know, for example, is asked to be a witness about a case and whether the person who is asking him is his friend or his enemy or a stranger, when you know the truth, you have to be a witness and give your testimony for the truth. And then the other thing is that you have to also make sure that you don't harm the truth by mentioning the truth in conditions or settings which are not appropriate. This is something which is the link between the existential meaning of truth and ethical meaning of truth. I don't have time to mention, but just very briefly, sometimes something may be true but not right to say. If someone, for example, uh, has an accident and uh, is killed, you don't go to the mother of that person and right away tell the truth. You have to wait, you have to prepare that lady and give the news. It doesn't mean that you are not truthful. You are truthful, but to be truthful doesn't mean to say the truth right away without preparation regardless of what is going to be useful for not your personal interest, but for the interest of the public or the good of the public. Anyway, so these are different things about truth that I don't have time. I just wanted to summarize the major points. And then there are some characteristics about truth which are very interesting for me. One of the things that we find in the Quran about truth is that 
God the Almighty in Surat Ra'd, the founder, which is chapter 13, number 17, says that the example of truth and falsehood is like when there is a rain and then the water, you know, flows and then you have like a river or a sea and then you have bubbles and these bubbles are on the surface. These bubbles are uh, not, uh, you know, filled with water. They look real, but these are just bubbles. So it's, you know, inside empty. So God the Almighty says, This is the way that God brings the parable or the example of truth and falsehood. Those bubbles, they will stop soon. They will finish. But what is going to benefit people that will remain. So, it's very important. Truth or haq is something which benefits people. If you have some idea which is not beneficial, that is not true idea. You must have made a mistake. Any person who has some understanding of his religion or anything that is destructive, so that cannot be true. Because God says, And before that he says, So what is false may cover the surface, may attract your attention, but sooner or later it will go away. What is beneficial, what is true, it will remain. This is very important and we have also several other verses in the Quran which says that this is the nature of you know, truth and falsehood that truth remains and falsehood goes away for example in Surah Kahf number 56 God says truth or the true has come and the falsehood or fa the false has gone away if it was up to here, you might say, okay, this was one case. But then God says in a general way, This is the nature of the falsehood that cannot endure. It will perish. Or in Surah Anbiya number 18, God says we heat with the truth, the falsehood. And then the falsehood will go away, will be finished, will be destroyed. And also Surah Saba number 49, So, this is also a great, I think, lesson for us. It's very a spiritual lesson for our politicians or social activists or any person who is doing anything in society uh, that sometime may think that we have to compromise a little bit about the truth because that doesn't serve our interests. So no problem because you have good intentions so don't bother that much about the truth. This is not acceptable. You cannot serve the truth by hiding or denying or ignoring or rejecting the truth. And don't wait for quick results. Maybe in the short term by saying something honest, by accepting, you know, something right from your enemy, maybe you are losing. But that is not really loss. This is finishing soon. What remains is your commitment to the truth and that will bring for you in the long term victory and support of God the Almighty. The other point that we have about Islamic ideal society is that it is a society which is science-based. This is very important. Not only we as individuals should acquire knowledge, 
we as a community also must be a community which is after scientific uh, development. And I think it's not very difficult to understand that the harm that ignorance can cause for a society is much more than the harm of ignorance for one person. What does it mean that a society is ignorant? This is a very important point. Unfortunately, we think that, like many other cases about social values, that if you have a society in which every person is educated, then you have a science-based society, which is not the case. So if you have all members of our society educated, if they have even you know, degrees from universities and postgraduate studies, everything, this doesn't mean necessarily that science is the governing factor in your society or community. You may have very educated individuals, but those who are making decisions, if those decisions are not based on science and on knowledge, then what is the benefit of having millions of educated people, but no one takes that into account when it is a matter of social policy making? So, an Islamic society is the society that, as a whole, is geared towards science and implements science. This is very important. Of course, science for us is very clear that it's not against religion. And science and religion uh, very much uh, cooperate. And we believe that uh, there is no conflict at all between true and proper science and proper understanding of religion. So this is also something very important. And if you look at the Prophet wasallam, in a society in which there was not many literate people, the number of people who were able to read and write were less than the number of fingers of one person. So in that society, which were not interested in knowledge, there were no schools, you know, nothing. The Prophet so much encouraged Muslims to learn and to educate themselves that very soon a great civilization was founded and Muslims were very advanced in sciences and you know that many sciences uh, that uh, went to Europe went through Muslims, and Muslims not only just received from you know other sources, they added a lot. They were very cre creative in philosophy. You know, good studies have been done. There are studies which show that how many new problems were added by Muslim philosophers to the philosophical problems of the Greek philosophers in chemistry, in mathematics, in physics, in medicine. This was not something which could be achieved by just saying to people, go and learn as individuals. No, the whole society, the whole system was planned in the way that science was encouraged. I don't have time to mention that he, how, for example, our imams and the you know, members of the Ahlul Bayt, how much they respected you know, people who had knowledge, even sometimes, you know, they were criticized, but didn't stop them. How much the Prophet uh, encouraged the society to be uh, run according to science. And another thing is, which is re related to moderation and balance, but is different, is softness. We need to have this softness and distance from rigidness in our society. This has different levels. It can be discussed in the level of law, how Islamic law is a very easy practicing law. The Prophet said, بُعِثْتُ عَلَى الشَّرِيعَةِ سَمْحَةِ sahla." God has given me a sharia, a code of law, which is very easy to practice. 
Sometimes we make it very difficult or complicated, but Islamic Sharia is very easy to practice, and in most of the places in the world you can practice it in full. You don't need you know, to compromise. You can be a good practicing Muslim without having any problem in any part of the world. Of course, sometimes, you know, unfortunately, there are people that, in the name of secularism, they don't let any person to practice uh, his religion or her religion. That's another issue. But normally speaking, Muslims don't demand that much so that they can practice. If you look at the demand of Muslims, it's very simple, very basic. Just let them, you know, be free to observe certain things which are not causing any problem for anyone. So the Sharia is very easy Sharia for practice. When it comes to government and the leaders, very much emphasis has been put on being soft and kind and merciful. <clears throat> I give you two references. One is to the Prophet wasallam, and the other is to the letter which Imam Ali gave to Malik Ashtar when Imam appointed him as governor of Egypt. About the Prophet, I already mentioned a little bit about the mercifulness of Prophet. You know, in the Quran, there is a beautiful point about Prophet Musa. Prophet Musa was asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to go along with his brother Harun and speak to Pharaoh. And this is very important. God asked Musa to go and speak to Pharaoh. God didn't say to Musa, by court Pharaoh. He said, go and speak to Pharaoh. And speak to him with a soft language. Why? Maybe he remembers. He remembers his Lord. He remembers the missing aspects of his conscience and humanity. Oh, Yaksha. He becomes humble. He fears his Lord. So, even with respect to Pharaoh, with all the mischief that he created, God says, go and speak to him softly. There is a chance that maybe it works. And, you know, Musa was worried and they said, you know, uh, we are worried and yafrota alayna awan yatqa. Maybe he gets angry with us and he's going, you know, to kill us and let, uh, doesn't let us to finish our mission. And God said, Enni. This is very beautiful for those who want to work for unity and peace. God says, Enni ma'akuma asma'u wa ara. I am with you. I am hearing and watching you. Don't worry. You do the job properly and I'm going to be with you. And interestingly, in another place, God says, Fatia, come to Pharaoh. It means that I am already there waiting for you. Here says, you know, go there. I am with you. But in another place says, come to Pharaoh. It means that I am there. It's a very beautiful point. So, God says to Musa, speak softly. When it comes to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, God stresses on this lean, this softness, but in a different way. God says, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُ because of receiving mercy from God, you have become soft. You are a soft person with the people. I'm sure you understand the difference being a speaking softly and being a soft person. When you are a soft person, means every aspect of your personality must be soft, not just in your speech. Sometimes people speak you know, very nicely, but then they, you know, do things against you that you don't know. They harm you. Or they are very rigid. They speak, you know, very nicely, but they are very rigid and very, you know, hard-hearted. 
But Allah says to the Prophet that you have become a soft person. If for Musa was a command, this is a statement. God is saying that this is the case with you. فَبِمَا رَحْمَةً مِنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ You have become a soft person. And the Prophet was so soft that sometimes some people wanted to take advantage. For example, one of the things that we find in the Quran is that when they wanted to talk to Prophet wasallam, they didn't observe any protocol. There were people, not everyone, but there were people that used to go outside the house of the Prophet and just shout and ask him to come out. Calling him by his name and saying, come out, I want to speak to you. And God said, should I stop this? The Prophet didn't stop them, God stopped them. These are the people who don't understand. This is not the way you speak to a normal person, let alone to the Prophet. Or if they wanted to visit the Prophet, some people used to enter the house of the Prophet without asking for permission. And this man was so soft that he didn't stop them. Then God said, Ya amanu, la nabi illa an lakum. Before you get permission, don't go to the house of the Prophet. And when they used to go to the house, they were not coming out. They said, you know, we should have a dinner with you or lunch with you. And God says, you know, if you go there, don't wait for the food. And after they had food, they said, okay, now is a good time to listen to you for hadith. God says, فَإِذَا تَعِمْتُمْ فَانْتَشَرُوا At least if your food is given, please go. This man has his life. He's a very busy man. But he was so soft that he was not, you know, putting pressure on people. He was putting pressure on himself. So, you see that how this man, in a matter of 23 years, he changed the people who had no mercy for their daughters, for their children. They were honored of killing and looting. Even, you know, one of them said, I am very sad that I have a tribe that doesn't know how to loot and kill. لَيْتَ لِي بِهِمْ قَوْمًا إِذَا رَكِبُوا شَنُّ لِغَارَةَ الرُكْبَانَ Of course, I said, I wish instead of my tribe, I had a tribe which were very good in looting and attacking and killing. Inside society, he changed the people to the state that they were ready to die for each other. Not everyone, but many people. To the extent that in one of the battles, when there were some injured soldiers, so a person went to give them water. You know, when you are injured, you are very thirsty. So he wanted to give water. The first person said, my brother next to me is more thirsty. Give to my brother. He went to the second person. He said, give to my other brother. By the time he reached the last one, he was dead. So he came back, all were dead. So they died without drinking because they wanted to offer this water to their brothers. This is the result of the mercy and softness of the Prophet And something which is very difficult for me not to say it because I think this is something that we need also to learn from the Prophet is his ability, extraordinary ability to listen. You know, when your age becomes, I don't know, 40, 50, 60, you may not have that patience for listening. On top of your age, if you are a busy person, and then if you are a leader, and then if you are a person that receives communications from God, so imagine you, to have all these things in your mind, then be ready to listen to people who may not have you know, anything significant to say. Sometimes they say nonsense. But the Prophet never rushed them, never interrupted them. Whenever someone was speaking to the Prophet, he was listening as if he had no, nothing else to do. 
Unfortunately, again, what happened was some people started criticizing the Prophet. But it is good that, alhamdulillah, it reached this level so that today we can learn. Allah says in Surah Tawbah, وَمِنْهُمُ الَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ النَّبِيهِ وَيَقُولُونَ هُوَ أُذُنْ There are people who annoy the Prophet and say, this man is ear. Meaning that he so much listens that it is only an ear. Means he has nothing else to do. It's just ear. What can an ear do? An ear can listen. Ear cannot speak, cannot think, cannot do anything. Ear can just listen. So they said, this man is ear. I think this is a miracle. To be a man at that status. And Jibra'il, Gabriel comes to you to speak and deliver the message of God. And then you remain so kind with your people. That then they criticize you. So it was not that because he wanted, you know, to appear like some politicians. Some politicians, you know, pretend that they are very good, you know, they listen, you know. But this is just what they pretend. The prophet was doing this when he was blamed for this. This is important. He didn't do this to please anyone. So he was blamed for this. And then God says, If he is an ear, قُلْ أُذُنُ خَيْرٍ لَكُمْ if he's a ear, he's a good ear for you. He's showing respect to you. يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَيُؤْمِنُ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ So, this is the softness of the Prophet. And now, look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We cannot understand Allah's mercy. Then Allah says to the Prophet, لَوْ كُنْتَ فَضَّنْ غَلِيذَ الْقَالِبِ لَنْ فَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكَ If you were hard-hearted, if you were harsh, they would have left you. فَعَفُوا عَنْهُمْ God says, now I want from you to forgive them. If they do anything wrong, forgive them. Look at the mercy of Allah. Allah says to the Prophet, I know that you are a soft person. لَنْ تَلَّهُمْ but you are a human being. Maybe sometimes, you know, you may be in very, very difficult situation. Maybe it would be very difficult for you. Or maybe you think because these people have said something that this has displeased me or angered me. You want to do something. Don't worry. Forgive them. Pardon them. And this is very beautiful. God says, ask me also to forgive them. You know, God wants to forgive them. So he says, ask me to forgive them. If the prophet asks God to forgive them, definitely they are forgiven. But to establish the position of the prophet, so God says, you know, people should go and ask the prophet to pray for them. And in Islam, no one can forgive other than God. But you can ask God on behalf of someone to forgive. So the Prophet was doing a step far for people, but he was not forgiving people as far as the Prophet's, uh, sorry, God's right is concerned. He was forgiving his own rights, but he was not able to forgive like what we have in some other traditions. So this softness of the Prophet is very important, and this is something that we expect from a leader or from leadership or from those who are in charge of the affairs to observe. And then Imam Ali alayhi salam. You know, Imam Ali alayhi salam is also very important because he ruled for about almost five years, less than five years. So it's important that this is an experience of having a government which is, uh, you know, has tried to be an Islamic government. Imam Ali was very concerned about being kind with people and respecting people, not humiliating people. In one case, Imam appointed a judge and before the day finished, he dismissed the judge. The judge. Even for one day, he didn't work. He was surprised, you know, what happened? Imam said that I received the report that in the court, you raise your voice over the voice of the people. So you are not a good person. 
A judge cannot say because I am judge I can you know shout and you have to respect me. So he dismissed it immediately. In his letter to Malik Ashtar, he said, omurek." In your affairs, you must be very gentle, soft, and moderate. Don't treat people, na'uzubillah, God forbid, like animals or slaves. No, these are human beings. These are honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you are responsible for that. Amuraka berrafi umurek. Walin, wal adl. You must be soft, you must observe justice. Fa innaka mas'ulun an lalik. You will be questioned about this. I am going to question you and God is going to question you. So, this is another aspect of Islamic society that people must be respected. People must be treated with honor, with softness, like the way that you treat your children. This is what we have to expect from Islamic system. One general point is that I think we have to revisit many of moral teachings and reinterpret them in the light of what we have said. Unfortunately, most of the time, we have interpreted everything in a personal way. For example, hospitality. You know, in Islam, hospitality is a very important value. So much so that it is taken as a sign of Iman, a sign of faith. If you believe in God, you must honor your guests. I hope our brothers here are doing this with you. So you should, inshallah, be treated in the best way. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is a sign of Iman. But normally we take it in a personal way. If I have some visitors in my house or in my office, this is the way that we interpret hospitality. But I think we have to rethink about hospitality. What does hospitality require from a state? How should you deal with your tourists if you are a Muslim society? Have you ever thought about this? How should you treat Asylum seekers. How should you treat diplomats, diplomatic crews, as a Muslim who wants to be hospitable? I don't think we have ever worked out these things, or at least I haven't seen that much. Maybe I am ignorant. Of course I am ignorant. The other thing is, for example, about security. Security is something very important. You know, one of the characteristics of Islamic ideal society, which I don't have time to explain, is security. But this security is not just something personal. You know, we have hadith which says, Al Muslimu man salum al Muslimun man yadihi wa A Muslim is the one that other people should feel safe. No harm should come to them through the tongue or hand of this Muslim. If I am harming you with my tongue or hand, I am not a Muslim. Okay? But this must be reinterpreted when it comes to the responsibility of our society. Sometimes we see that we have very pious people, but when it comes to social, political field, you don't feel that security. They say, because it's a political issue, so you can speak about everything of the life of that person. Or you can, you know, do anything. I am sure this person never has treated anyone outside his political, social life like this. He's such a pious person. But when, you know, it's in politics, you know, parties, different things, then we bring, you know, excuses to forget 
In an Islamic society, people must be very safe with respect to reputation. What is the point that you, you know, live a life of piety for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, lots of services, then one journalist finishes all your reputation?